So thanks everyone who attended the last talk of the CityCon. Uh, it uh, was a very long day and I really much appreciate everyone who joined me today to uh, listen and to uh, maybe share some feedback uh, with, with our journey in Ring Central, what we are doing. And when I started to preparing this talk, this presentation, I go on through several phases. I tried to talk about different things. Uh, but in my opinion, the most important part is not what you can read in documentation or what you can get online, uh, or I could not give talk about the flux or any other stuff better than the creators of these tools who are present at this conference. What I will try to do today is to share our journey in Ring Central, how we ended where we right now with continuous delivery, uh, what things was what we did was good and what was bad and how to avoid some mistakes. So like real life examples, real, <laughs> real life. Uh, so I will try to do it as a kind of story. So with prologue, three acts and epilogue. <laughs> so it will be a little bit more fun than just a regular talk, but we'll see how it goes. So in prologue, I will introduce our actors. The first actor is me. <laughs> nice to meet you. My name is Ivan. Uh, I'm working in Central from year 2015, but I had a break. I left Ring Central and, and then rejoined, started my uh, working in uh, one of the startup companies. But essentially, more or less, I worked in Ring Central for six years. Uh, launched multiple projects, real projects. Uh, I was uh, across like I was started this project, led them from start to finish. These projects landed in the hands of real customers and with thousands upon thousands of customers, happy customers who are using these projects right now. Uh, I am currently Director of Engineering at Central and my current role more or less is uh, I work on the latest project, on a video project, and uh, I will tell you a little bit more about the company itself. So what is Ring Central? Uh, Ring Central is, uh, I don't know, may, most likely, does anyone heard of Ring Central before? Like, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. So it's a public company, that's quite a big company, which provides so-called unified communication as a service. And um, what's one of our product called MVP, <laughs> Media Phone, uh, uh, sorry, Message uh, Video Phone, and uh, what it does, it provides to businesses around the world ability to cons like organize the your communications with outside world and with inside world, meaning all the communication inside the company, like a phone calls, messaging, co video conferencing, so messaging things Slack, video conferencing things Zoom, <laughs> and phone is just a regular telephone system. Um, and the uh, company, it's quite, like I said, quite a big, big company. We have global pro presence around the world. So North America, it's uh, uh, South America, Southeast Asia, uh, and Europe. So we are present almost everywhere in the world. So for example, if you know some of the big companies like AT&T, Telus, Verizon, Vodafone, we, all our partners, uh, we, work, we work very closely with them. And most likely, even if you do not know about Ring Central, because we work in a B2B space, you like most likely uh, encountered <laughs> it before when you called, for example, Telos and uh, was called on the line or something like this. All this was handled by Rick Central servers. Not all, but some of the stuff is handled by Rick Central in our system. So it's <laughs> quite, quite a lot of uh, deployments um, uh, around the world. So one of the things, one important stuff which we are proud of is we have like five nights uptime SLA, which we are constantly uphold year after year for multiple years. Uh, because when we're talking about this communication, it's the last thing which should go out. Yeah. So multiple things can break, but you should be able to communicate with your customers and inside your organization. Uh, we also provide our services not only just regular regular businesses, but to small and big enterprises, as well as the government organizations, healthcare institutions, and uh, uh, universities and educational institutions. 
So we have multiple attestations, multiple certificates, all the stuff, so we need to handle it. We need to make sure we are compliant, we need to make sure we protect our user privacy, and all of that quite a big challenge in a continuous delivery world and uh, when we're building pipelines and all the stuff. Uh, so this is our environment. Yeah, so we, it's a given state. We cannot, we, we must somehow in this given state make sure we can live in a modern world. Meaning we need to uh, not deploy every quarter like most telecom companies do. No, not most, but big amount of telecom companies do. Uh, we want to do it fast. We want to give our customers value as soon as we could. So how do, do we, what, what steps we took on this journey? So is it act one, <laughs> I would say, and this may be the most important act of the journey. It's the year 2015 when I joined the company and I started to work on analytics project. Analytics is uh, it's called real-time analytics and it was one of the most uh, it was, even to this day, most like, successful internal project because it started completely from scratch, from the green field. And uh, to this day, our real-time analytics, our quality of service analytics and everything we do for our customers in terms of we, uh, analytical capabilities is considered best on the market for UCAS providers. So how we did it? So uh, it's interesting. I, I will, so things I will talk here will be a little bit controversial. I do not want to pit technologies against each other. I do not want to say these technologies work it, these technologies don't. I want to pit uh, methodologies and way of thinking against each other because we will see what, what I'm talking about later. So we started in 2015 and we had two big contenders in terms of containerization before we, everything was run in virtual machines. So it was VMware Cloud, uh, VMware on our own hardware, and we started, okay, we need to containerize, we need to start using Kubernetes. Uh, again, the year is 2015, Kubernetes is kind of very young, but uh, we also another contender, it's, it's Mesos and Mesos Marathon, which we tried to do as well, but we took two completely different approaches. One approach was DevOps, and another was DevOps. <laughs> so what do I mean by it? It's, uh, I, it, depend, it depended on the focus, you know, like this DevOps circle, or not circle, but infinity symbol, one is Dev, one is Ops, and they like inter, interconnect. It's usually very heavily, from my experience, is very heavily focused on Dev side or on the Ops side. And uh, they not evenly balanced. In our case, it was the same. So we had DevOps approach, which was heavily operational-sided, and DevOps approach, which was heavily dev-sided. I was working on the dev side, and another team, big team, worked on the operational side. So I would say, like, two, two things, uh, two approaches. Process kind of DevOps and department kind of DevOps. So when we're talking about the process side of DevOps, because we launched the Greenfield projects, analytics was a Greenfield project, we, we focused on end-to-end -end ownership very heavily. So we tried to give our customers product as fast as we could. And we were able to build our first version to was first real paying customer uh, in just four months. It was very quick for a company like Ring Central, trust me. Some projects takes years to launch. Uh, while the department DevOps, they focused on the operational side and we wanted to, we wanted to build a tool set. Like everyone does, even many companies does right now. So we hired DevOps engineers and we said, okay, we're going to do DevOps by building tools and doing all this stuff so our uh, developers could use uh, this new, new like uh, methods, use all this stuff. and. Uh, we concentrate on the tooling. The, the, another thing which was differentiated between the operational DevOps approach and, our upper, and, and like process DevOps is we focused on the mono repository. Everything was configured in one mono repository and it really stick, sticked. So we always started to use mono repository from this day and going forward, all our projects used mono repositories. And it's to this day, I think, the best possible approach in organizing your work because you have ability to atomically update configuration, update code, 
and package them together. And it's, there's a lot of tools which helps to work with non-repository like environments. Uh, so yeah, we, we focused on the delivery, like I said, we wanted to push updates to our customers like daily. Uh, even before like we knew about the Dora metrics, about all the stuff, we just wanted to make sure we can, can, can do it fast, as fast as possible. And we rejected some processes. Uh, we, and from the downside, we created our own tooling because again, year 2015, there's like no service mesh existed, at least the working condition. There's no operators, uh, no like great pipeline tools. So we've written everything from scratch. We use Scala programming language at that time. And we didn't document anything because we were focused just on the delivery. And of course, because of that, we had like really poor documentation. Effort. So I could say both these approaches, I will, do not want to wait which one was better, which one was worse. I only speak from my experience. So in our organization, our company, the second one never worked. I witnessed multiple projects which failed uh, on its tracks, or it's failed later in the year, or was cancelled after the year, or was achieved very little uh, meaningful output. And I think the main reason here is because people were focused, was not focused on the customer. And there's one great talk yesterday, it was called Process, or not, uh, People Process Tools. Yeah, and I think what we did here, I like, Unintentionally, we started with people and trying to mold the process before we worked on the tool, tools. So this was very, very important. And uh, yeah, but everything which matters is the customers and like a code. It's code we build and customers we serve. If anything in between, just noise. It's lost effort. It does not provide any value. So the very first lesson we learned and very important stuff without, which should be starting point in like GitOps and anything you build, at least from my experience as established DevOps culture. Without it, you will build tools. You will not, again, from my experience, very hard to succeed. i never seen a successful project which was focused on the operational side without like thinking about the cultural change first because in the end, after you did everything, you will just strike this resistance from the development side, from the business side, and project most likely will, will wither and die. So uh, it's a prerequisite. So fast forward, year 2019, and I worked on, like I did additional, additional projects, but I started to work in AI. Hot thing at the time, hot thing, right, even hotter right now, uh, we were building services for speech recognition, uh, computer vision, conversational intelligence, all this very interesting stuff. Transformers was published recently, so we were very excited and, and working on all this stuff. And uh, when we started to do these projects, uh, another big change happened in terms of how we approached uh, our development and what tools we used, and this change was GitOps, and uh, we found out what Flux exists. It was version even one or even zero something, like it's the very first version of Flux, the very first version of GitOps. And again, the Spinnaker versus Flux, do not say one better than another, but what we very heavily understood, and it was like this moment of clarity is we started to think not in terms of pipelines, but in terms of conditions. So I constantly hear in this conference, pipeline, pipeline, we build pipeline, we do pipelines. Uh, I think pipelines are evil. Yeah, so uh, pipelines are very hard to maintain in a real production scenario. Pipelines are hard to build and pipelines can, pipelines can be uh, really slow. So I, I can give you an example, yeah, real, real life example from a central point of view, is we have a pipeline, we can build a pipeline. Okay, we started to build a simple pipeline, so we build something, verify it, test it, uh, and then deploy to production, for example, or to, 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 to production, simple pipeline, it works. But when you start to see, okay, 
I need to run different kind of tests. I need to run regression tests. And what's about manual gateway? How do you how do I com uh, like accommodate this in pipeline? Okay, maybe I need to run pipeline in staging because this is critical uh, change. Uh, and how do I define which cri change is critical? Okay, I need to add change management procedures. I need to add additional security checks. I need to add pipe and pipelines just grows grows and it it. it Finish, never finish. Just, yeah, it, it takes too much time. And when you started to change pipelines, tooling changes, it, it's a mess. Very hard to reason about. So uh, here, when GitOps appeared and we started to like gather this puzzle, and we started to think about our software as not as a delivery cycle, not as a pipeline, but it, as a set of conditions which must be satisfied. So what do I mean by it? I mean, if I want to release, so how there, yeah, how does it, yeah? So, and I think this condition is a sliders in my head, yeah? So, and these conditions are equal maybe to, equal to requirements, equal to something else. Uh, I, I do not have a good name for it, yeah? So I went coin it when I'm preparing this presentation, but when you have a piece of software which need to be run on a specific environment, and, I, and here a common denominator is something running, codes running on an environment. In our case, it's a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we different types of environment for the same piece of code has different conditions. I mean, like in lab, you just need a working code. To, to be able to run it. In CI environment or integration environment, it needs to be not just working, but uh, like be at least without crashing bugs or not crashing all the time. Uh, in uh, Canary and the preview release for internal users, it needs to pass some security checks, some additional checks, uh, like quality gates, but it not need to be really, really robust. If we deploy, on the other hand, to our customers like a partners or, or companies like gas hospitals and healthcare institutions, it needs to have very rigorous security, uh, security checks run. And uh, we need to make sure what we run, we do not introduce any kind of backhauls and a kind of malware. So it takes, takes a lot of effort to do. But every environment has different requirements. And as soon as you satisfy these requirements, you can deploy. So instead of just a pipeline, which runs sequentially, right now you only have, like, I satisfy this condition, I can deploy it to this environment. And this changed our way of thinking with GitOps, essentially. So GitOps allowed us to do, to start thinking in this manner. Yeah, so we can, we have, uh, Git repository, which has all the environments and all the artifacts on this environment. And now we only need to make, we only need to in, make sure, ensure basically what we satisfy conditions. So uh, how we do it, we uh, changed uh, approach and we're gonna change it again. I will t tell a little bit later, but before few additional pieces, which was very important in this process. The first one is was like a no-brainer. We had the talks, we've seen the talks today about the canary releases and canary analysis. And one of the tools which we heavily use for all our stateless deployments is a flagger. Uh, so is anyone familiar with a flagger? Okay, so it's uh, it, it's a a uh, tool which also developed by Weaveworks, which allows you to basically configure uh, canary releases very easily. <laughs> very easily configure very easily canary releases. Uh, it makes, so it, it, you can uh, define like canary, red, red, um, red, black, blue, green release types. Uh, you can define the canary analysis routine. And it's, an, it's why it's important? Because when you have this work with GitOps, you really just change the environment, but it does not, you can, like already different talks was say today, uh, changing the environment could lead to uh, like problems. So you need additional verification. So flaggers help with that. So very important tool, look it out. Another tool which we also heavily use to satisfy the condition is a test cube. 
So test cubes allows us, again, part of the Kubernetes infrastructure, allows us to run tests in parallel in Kubernetes cluster and use API to verify what the specific type of conditions and test was, in fact, was run as an audit trail. So we will really launch this test and this test passed and we can rely on this like a requirement, like I said. Uh, we also use Caverna very heavily uh, because one thing is to have all these requirements uh, set up and have all the audit logs and all the trails uh, about what it was really launched. Another thing is to enforce it. So we use Caverna to enforce what all the requirements are in fact really uh, per, per, uh, exist on the piece of software we're trying to deploy. So like combining all that, we started to, we, we, like, we were able to change our tooling. Yeah, so we were able to replace one with another. We started to see what the benefits are. We started to work with different types of pipelines. And it's, it, it, it really uh, made everything a lot easier. So an additional thing which is, uh, uh, we also was very, very important for us. And uh, I also always uh, talk about it inside the company and trying all our developers, all our engineers to adapt is a hermetic build. So what does it mean? Hermetic build means when you build something in the different environments, uh, you always have the same result. So it's essentially hermetic. So I built it on my local machine, I built it on one CI server, I built it on another CI server. I have one artifact with exactly the same control sum. It, uh, first of all, it's very convenient. So you do not have this environment issue. Like you can build and reproduce it locally just from the commit. But another very important part here is ability to uh, build it from the security point of view, build the same thing on the multiple environments because this is one of the security, like security checks, yeah? What you need to ensure what you have, like secure build environments, all this stuff. So you can build on multiple environments and if we have drift of the control sum, we can figure out which environment could be compromised or we, have some, we could have some problems with it. It also allows us to deploy the same build everywhere. So again, uh, f like federal agencies, FedRAMP or institutional healthcare institution, we have very strict requirements where this build could be built, how it's built, what environment is used, who has access to this environment. And because of that, uh, when you, if you do not have hermetic build, you can essentially get a uh, different image and you deploy one thing in one environment, another thing in another environment and you're praying if, what, to the gods, maybe it, it, because it was <clears throat> built from the same sources, it should align. It's not, not always the case. So hermetic builds is very, very important. For, for that, we're using uh, NixOS for base layer, so it's isolates in it on the library level. We're using Bazel as a build tool and we, uh, yeah, and we orchestrate it uh, with using uh, GitLab pipelines, we're using GitLab internally. Uh, yeah, so moving forward today. So right now I'm working on the video project and this is, like I said, why we're using these tools like a flag girl, like a test cube, which part of the Kubernetes infrastructure, because we have APIs which are easy, easy to integrate. And when we have these uh, checks, we have to implement our own like, way of thinking, how to int we integrate it without pipelines, how we call one API calls another, a checks is satisfied. It's not, not, as, not, not as easy, <laughs> but, very, very cool thing happened recently. And this is ability to support OCI manifests and uh, ability to sign them. So what I mean by uh, OCI manifest, Flux allows you to package all your manifests into, OCI, or into a container image, OCI image in this case. And this container image is immutable. Yeah, you cannot, it already contains all the deployments, all the uh, container images you need, uh, all the settings, everything, like secrets, config maps, all the stuff. 
And then you can sign it. And you can sign it multiple times. So what we do right now to, to satisfy this condition, when we build an artifact using, uh, uh, we build an OCI artifact, when we just sign it very easily. So test passed, we have a signature. Security passed, we have a signature. Even manual QA regression could have could sign it. If we have, with, in some companies, we still have manual verification step. We could sign it. Um, secure builder uh, build the same kind of image. We sign it. We sign it like we can have, we can have 20, 30, 50 signatures on the image. And then one, what we do, we just basically all our environments are always verifi verify if image contains all the necessary signatures it can be deployed and it automatically promote. That's so it's completely asynchronous workflow uh, and uh, OCI artifacts and CrossSign simplifies it to the level it's really easy to do and really easy to reason about because you have an audit trail, you have a signature which you can trace and you can trust. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, and you can do it and different steps in this, in this process, in this condition, do not need to know anything about each other which is also very beautiful. So you could easily change it. Um, oops. So uh, in epilogue, uh, I had a different epilogue before, uh, before I attended this conference. This epilogue, epilogue was about Tech Raider. So we used and created um, a Tech Raider. And what it, what it was, it was um, like, anyone knows about Tech Raider? What is it? Okay, no, no, no hands. So Tech Raider is, uh, re again, really nice things inside the engineering ecosystem. It's a, like, it's a circle with different quadrants which are divided into adapt, not adapt, tri trial, etc. And you can easily like move some technologies and say this technology is good to adapt, this technology we should Deprecate, etc. So we, I, I thought, to, like in epilogue, talk about the Tech Raider, but I thought, like even now, it's not not as interesting. What is interesting is during this conference, I encountered the project called CD Events. I never heard about it before, but this project is very heavily resonates with stuff we do ourselves internally. So we're trying to like do this pipe like pipelineness delivery. And CD events, it's a specification. It does not have like real implementation, like real, real implementation right now. It's only like POC. But it tries to define uh, this common ground between all the components, common APIs, and how each system in continuous delivery, each part in continuous delivery ecosystem should uh, what events it should provide, how it should be consumed, etc. So it can be easily integrated into something much bigger. So what I think in our case, in case Ring Central is, yes, we're using Signature, it's a very beautiful solution right now, but we're definitely gonna, going to look into CD events because it looks like finally we're starting to get this level of integration which does not rely on a pipeline. <laughs> on the Jenkins pipeline, GitLab pipeline, Tecton pipeline, etc. Yeah, it's just completely independent systems, completely independent tools which could talk uh, one language between each other. So it's a beautiful solution. So I really, uh, again, it's my recommendation, go look it out. It's a great uh, project and I think it has very bright future. Okay, so yeah, let's end. Uh, any questions? You make some analysis of the events, yes, in your book. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, yesterday in CD Evans and uh, look like it's work. And now you told how, how you make it in your company. You not use pipe pipeline, you use different uh, environments and build some something for these environments. And I, I remember CD events uh, work same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, like we completely came to this independently. I think it's additionally verifies and uh, says like if 
we did something in the same manner community trying to move, I think we did the right stuff. So for me, it was very, um, like, I was very excited. It was a pleasure for, to, for me to hear what people, like, we did the right thing, essentially. It's a validation. Uh, but we build ourselves, but I think you should not, we, we will have CD events, and if you want to move in this direction, I think it's better to take existing tool and we will at least existing approach and try to adapt it. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, also one one thing. Sorry, uh, because you, if like Vancouver is a really beautiful city <laughs> and a beautiful neighborhood here. I live in Vancouver, like I said. So I, if you have time, go to to the hike. It's an excellent weather. Uh, you can go to up north to Squamish, hike on Chief, hike on Grus Mountain. Oh, hike like Eagle Bluffs here in the mountains. It's 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 experience of a lifetime. Thank you.